Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Monday edition of Benzinga Free Market Prep. Spencer Israel, Joel Elkan, and Dennis Dick with you as always. This morning is the calm before the storm. We know what we have later in the week. We know we have the Fed meeting. We know we have a jobs number. We know we have a lot of earnings, but not much today. Some drug news to talk about, some mergers, a couple of ratings that are interesting, but it's mostly just the calm before the storm. I guess starting after the Delta Day with earnings like Beyond Meat and a hundred others. It's a busy week for earnings, busy week across the board. Quiet this morning, Joel. What's up in the S and P's? Uh, we're up in the S and P, Spencer. Uh, your pre-market low comes in at thirty twenty, exactly where I was trying to bid. Got big, nothing done on that one. Uh, pre-market high twenty seven and a quarter. Not much up there. We made a new all-time high on Friday at twenty nine fifty. We'll keep an eye on that. Greener skies ahead. Crude up 11 cents at 56.31. Gold basically unchanged up 60 cents at 14.32.80. Silver hanging in there at uh, 16.40, uh, up 1.3 cents at 16.410. Oh, and Bitcoin once again doing the uh, 10,000 dance here. Now back under 10,000, down $475 at 9,500. $9, uh, triple D, long way from Friday here, but uh, here we are, Monday morning. Looks like the market's going to continue its march north. Yeah, you're always trying to remember. I mean, after a weekend, you're trying to go back and remember what was going on on Friday, and I guess you can just keep remembering that. We're in this bull market, and they just do you know relentless buying no matter what, and you saw a lot of stocks rallying across the board. You actually saw a lot of stocks that had been lagging rallying as well so it was an interesting friday again market just strong this market just buys no matter what like you said it's the calm before the storm here spencer in the intro we have a lot of earnings coming up here tonight we've got a lot of earnings coming up this week we had a big day on thursday but this morning it's very quiet from the earnings front do we have anything reporting this morning well, yeah, we had uh, Mylan and Pfizer, which I don't know if they were scheduled, but because they announced this merger of sorts, they both reported along with that. Oh, that... did they report too? Yeah, yes. They're, okay, they're... Well, this is the big news of the day, so we might as well go right into this. Right. So Mylan and Pfizer, uh, Pfizer's Upjohn is going to merge with, with Mylan, create a new company, which Mylan shareholders will own 43% of, Pfizer shareholders will own uh, the rest of, and... Uh, Mylan reported, as I mentioned, they beat on their uh, EPS estimate, beat on their sales estimate. Pfizer also reported this morning they beat on their EPS estimate and missed on their sales estimate, and they lowered their guidance for the year. They lowered their EPS guidance by about seven cents, and they lowered their their sales guidance by about one point five billion dollars. I mean, these generic drug makers have been in so much pain really here. So it's not surprising that, you know, you're getting a huge lift here for MYL. Although it's leaked off the highs, it's still trading up 20 or 16% here this morning. You are seeing the other generics trade up as well on this news. Teva's trading higher up 5.8%. The Canadian company, Bosch Health Companies, BHC trading up 1.8% here in the pre-market. Uh, so you're seeing a lift here, but again, uh, this is very specific, obviously, to MYL shareholders being rewarded here this morning. Stock's been the gutter for so long. I can remember I owned this one in my best portfolio up at 40, and I just getting that bad taste. I actually cut the loss when it started to take out support. I think at like 35 or 36. Glad I did that because it's now 18. So sometimes it's good to take those losses in your investment portfolio. I guess this was one that I was happy that I sold. Is uh is Mylan gonna? I mean, is still gonna trade the other parts of the company, or are they going? Yeah, that, that's a question. So, are you just getting a separate company here for MYL, or is this MYL yeah. itself going to convert into this new Pfizer company? No, no, no. It's it's a spinoff, as, as okay. I I understand it. Um, so Mylan's gonna spin off with Pfizer and form this other company. Yeah, that's, it's all it's they're spinning off. It's it's off patent drugs business is what. Okay. It is. So and MYL is still they're working. merging it gotcha. with with Pfizer's. Uh, gotcha. 
you know, myelin, I mean, it's been around for a, a while, but it never re- ever really recovered from the uh, EpiPen thing. Remember oh, that? No, it didn't. And, and what year would have that been? That back in 2015? That, that, that was two years ago, I think. But I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thinking longer, Spencer. I, mean, I think that was 2015. Years are flying by here now as you get older. Yeah. Uh, wait, wait, let me rephrase what I just said. Mylan is merging with Pfizer's off-patent business. So they're basically onboarding a new business, and that's going to be a new company. Okay. Going back, though, I think you're right, Joel. I think it was, I think it was 2015. It was. You're correct. I'm looking when the, when the stocks are going from 70 all the way down to 40, and it never did recover. And generics have just been a mess. Like, we know Teva. And you look at Teva, it was $70 back in 2015, 7 bucks here now completely different story here but bhc was 260 dollars back in 2015 it's 23 bucks here now so i'm not even sure you know why they have been such a mess you know there's obviously people that follow the sector closer than i do i try to follow a little bit of everything trade a little bit of everything but they've been a mess forever um debt's been a major issue here maybe that's just the issue with all three of these companies has been debt uh but you know my own labs actually of those three has actually held up the better one it's only down like 70 percent from those highs in 2015 so this 21 does this 15 percent pop here is nice for everybody who bought in the last few weeks or even the last month or two but really when you put it in perspective everybody is still underwater in the stock and uh, the Milan, I think, and I'm just going looking at the price action. I think it was like around 41.42 when that news came out. It already come off that 70 high, and then boom, then it went down into the 20s. But uh, we see it trading up on uh, 298 year. Not sure how to really fairly value based on the Pfizer since it's a uh, you know they're losing part of the company. I could just tell you the uh, the initial pop in Milan. Uh, you made a pre market high at uh, 24. 24 and 19 and now you're just kind of sloping slope slumping here uh at 21.40 uh pfizer just hit a wall of 43 uh you can see you just had a seller out there for several days just above 43 yeah. so if you go into rally mode i'd like to see it anywhere you know 42.90 to 43.10 since that encompasses two four six eight ten last 12 highs have been 43 ish so if we ever get back up to that area that's gonna be major resistance what about that support that 42 if it takes yeah, I see that too i see that too i was just gonna mention that the, these things you know can get ugly sometimes too we know when and this isn't a, a pure merger so it's not like the choir but they lowered guides a lot of bad things i and I own Pfizer in my long-term investment portfolio. I'm in it from the teens. I'm holding on to it, and so I'm not selling out of that. But if I was in this for a trade, I'd be very nervous. I think this thing could pull back further here yet today. Uh, if it takes out that 42, it's kind of a slippery slope. And we've seen these things get really ugly before when they're you know doing – and it's not an acquisition, but even you know these spinoffs and they're lowering guidance. Not a lot of good news there, really, out of my perspective for Pfizer. I mean, merging with a spin you know, with, with a part of Mylan Labs just doesn't sound that great to me as a Pfizer shareholder. So, and I'm a Pfizer shareholder, so I'm speaking behind, beyond, you know, as a Pfizer shareholder. Uh, so, I don't love this idea. And I don't love the fact that they, you know, the guidance wasn't great here either. So, I, I think, you know, I'm going to hold on. Like I said, I'm going to hold on my long term shares. But short term here, I think you could see some continued weakness. And uh, what do they want growth? Do they want to cut cost? I mean, you know, what is, you know, what is the impetus for doing this merger too? I mean, growth and well, they, they said, they said they were going to last year. They said okay. they were going to reorganize uh, three units. They were, re- uh, they're, they're going to reorganize into three units, separating their consumer healthcare business. I'm reading from Reuters now. So they said they were going to do it and I guess they're doing it. So I don't know. Raise cash, maybe. Uh, Tava is getting a pop off this. You get people that like to, you know, to trade uh, the other That's stock the... in the sector. That has just been a perennial dog. And real they... bad. Real, it's been a really ugly stock. And it's just been leaking. Someone got uh, a little excited here when it popped up to 845. It's already given back 50 cents of those gains. So uh, let's see. Top of yesterday's range and the close is 754. So. I don't know if I, I wouldn't be chasing this thing on this news, but if it came back to unchanged 750, 760 area, I'd be looking at that as support now with the good news out there. But this is just specific uh, to Mylan Labs and Pfizer. 
jump over. There is other drug news here this morning. We had some news from Keytruda and Merck. Uh, that's obviously one of their drugs that it seems to be in the news all the time, and it always seems to get a pop on it. But anyways, uh, then uh, it seems to give it back. I don't know if that's going to happen here, but it looks like it's already starting to happen here. Uh, I do have some trading positions on Merck, so I'll limit my commentary okay. to a certain extent, but I have them on the long-term portfolio too, so I'm all over this. So I'll just let Joel do the technicals and talk well, about it. Merck's, Merck's Keytruda in combination with chemotherapy met one of the dual primary points in a pivotal phase three trial and they also received a positive opinion from the european medicines agency so good headlines this morning for merck yeah remember this always seems to apply to bristol myers as well we're not seeing bmy but it seems like when you get the positive news for merck you turn around and you seem to uh, bristol myers goes the other way right this is for keytruda or keytruda data because they have a competing drug right spencer i believe yes <laughs> we've talked about this on the show before yeah. So what's good for usually Keytruda is usually bad for Bristol Myers. Not that, but the last few moves have been a lot muted. So I don't know. This is you know good news obviously for Keytruda. So I don't know if they're going to hit BMY on this or not. It's uh, trading down twenty cents in the pre market, so that you know might be a reason. BMY has been a wild child itself since its earnings report. Crazy candle there on Friday. I mean, look at the Bristol Myers movement. Had the huge run, open at the highs, which was way overdone. Came in a dollar and a half, which is a huge move for Bristol Myers. Then ride a dollar towards the end of the day. So it's just been wild in itself without any news on anything right now. Well, obviously they had the earnings, but I mean, the Friday, there was no news. <laughs> uh, Merck is getting a little bit, it's getting a nice little pop here. You have cleared the pair of highs from Thursday and Friday at the 8150 area. So that will now act as support. But to me, I want to see this barrel through 83 uh, on this news. 83.06 uh, was your high on uh, Thursday. And so I look at that, another 75 cents away from that. And I look at that as resistance, another high at 82.96. So I like 83 as far as resistance. If this doesn't you know, get off the hop here and continue to rally, then come back and test the support, which, which was the uh, former resistance, the close on Friday, 81.43. We got another merger here too, a smaller one, Exact Sciences, doing an acquisition. Tell us about this one, Spencer. Yep, they are buying uh, Genomic Health this morning for seventy-two dollars a share in cash and stock. So symbol E X A S for G H D X. Those are the symbols. G H D X. What is the merger terms here? Seventy-two dollars a share, cash and stock. Do we know what that, when I say wow. stock, do we know what the, can you jump into the details for our risk arbitrators out there? Because I'm one of them. What the ratio is. Um, and uh, so, okay. Genomic health shareholders will receive 2750 in cash. Yeah. 4450 in shares of EXIS. Subject. Do Okay, so forty four fifty. So now we got to add up. So so what? There should be an actual number in there. I can go hunt it down too. If you don't have it in the press release, I'm sure it's already out there. Those risk arbitrators figure this out really fast. I that's, just haven't. That's what, what the PR. That's what the PR says. Okay. It, so. it's, it's the twenty seven fifteen cash plus forty four fifteen in in exact sciences. Okay, if somebody's got that. I can just grab try to grab it fast here too. I'm looking at myself. So Joel, talk about it for a second. Uh, I limit my comments on this one. I'm a I'm an owner, so I don't. Know. <laughs> Which one do you got? Exact sciences? Yeah. Okay, yep. so I, I don't have to limit my comments because this is obviously it's a fairly sizable deal. I think for it. let's just go see the size. So do you have the the size of the deal? Because that matters to exact sciences. Uh, the, I'm asking a lot of questions. The exact size of the deal is two point eight billion dollars. Okay, so exact science is market cap. This is always the exercise you should be doing when you're looking at it. It's a $15 billion company. So GHDX, and you go look at this, because typically they've been knocking off the premium that they pay. Although there wasn't a huge premium being paid here, they must have, this must have been known already, because I'm just looking here, and the stock had been running here for three days. Was this rumors about this three days ago already on GHDX? Because this been, yes. look at the chart, well, this has been going up. And you could talk about GHDX, Joel, because you yeah. haven't. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Someone definitely got the memo here. I mean, it, it must have been rumored. Yeah. It must have been rumored when it gapped up. And let, did it have earnings or something on the uh, on the 23rd? It went from 56.77 to 65.22 on uh, quadruple or five times its average. Got to be the rumors. There must have been rumors yeah. on this. I have not been following the story at all. So. I didn't hear it either. When you look at that chart, it looks like it was out there already. 
yeah. Not, not saying anything dirty. It was probably literally already somebody has posted a rumor on this. I'm just trying to look here too. Yeah. There was a headline that they're joining in uh, the S the S and P small cap index. That was last week, but no, that wouldn't have done it. Um, oh yeah, that can do it. Oh yeah, if okay. they joined an S and P small caps, GHDX was. Yeah. Oh yeah, that'll cause a pop. Okay. So really, when you look at it here, from obviously from Friday, this is not you know a huge premium that's being paid here. I guess you know it, it, the stock is already down, so it's come off those highs. Because if you add up the seventy two, what'd you say, forty four fifty and twenty seven fifty. That's what so, I said. We're just trying to figure this out on the fly, guys. So just bear with us here. So 72, and that adds up to the 72. So exact science is... 27.50 was the cash component. Yeah, and then the 44.50 in stock. Right. So I'm still looking for that actual amount. But exact science is trading out 6 bucks on this. So it looks like, and we Absolutely. again, we've seen this before where these mergers happen and they hit them, but it doesn't look like a huge premium being paid at least to the Friday close. So usually what happens here in these risk garb situations, what we've been seeing happen lately, is the premium that gets paid, they knock that off the acquire. But if you're taking it from 68, 66 and looking at 72, it wasn't really that huge of a premium being paid. If you're taking it from, you know, when before the headline from July 23rd and looking at it from that pricing, then yes, you know, there was a pretty good premium paid here. But that's usually what the risk garbs have been doing. I, there's no formula for that. It's just what I've been noticing. Maybe it's selective perception. But it's what I've been noticing is that usually the premium that's being paid gets knocked off the acquirer for some reason. That's the way the risk garbs have been trading it lately. So, anyways, exact sciences is down obviously for that reason. Yeah, I'm just looking. I'll just look at the chart here. It did have a, a long consolidation here and had all that support at 115 and change. So, 114. That's through that. So, I'd say that double bottom at 110. But again, on these merger terms, stuff happens. So, you know, these things can really move quickly here and they can take out levels in a hurry. I'm still, you know, shocked at the AbbVie, when, you know, how much premium they knocked off that when they bought Allergan. You know, that was down so much that it makes me scared to buy anything that's doing any type of acquisition, including the Pfizer here today, too, even though that's kind of, you know, not even a straight up acquisition. It just makes me scared to do it because they are just punishing acquirers in this market. All right, uh, it is 8.18, and we kind of have a sleepy S&P session so far here. Uh, we do have a nice range, seven-point range. We're still holding on to the close. That close at 3.024.50. That was your all-time closing high in the S&Ps. On Friday, uh, someone in the, uh, Google chat just asked about um, Amazon quickly the day after. Very quiet here. Boy, this thing is hardly moving in the after hours in pre-market. I just see if we get an earnings day low out of this move. I'd be focusing on that low from yesterday at 1924.51 on Friday. Uh, holds that, you know, go back up and fill the gap. Major resistance I now see forming at 2001. Those were your highs from uh, Wednesday and Thursday. So uh, let's see. They digested the report. Let's see if it could hold yesterday's low below 1924. Looking for some more downside in Amazon. One thing I will say with Amazon, after a few days here, if we stay in this bull market, I'd expect this thing to get bought too. I mean, we saw it with Netflix and maybe, you know, and, and Netflix has been just tearing. It seems like three, four days, stocks that are somewhat loved and Netflix still has a story. You know, we kind of dogged it and I thought it was going to fall under 300. So I got this one wrong because it did not. It turned around on that little double bottom, 305, 306, and then they ripped it. Even, you know, almost call it triple bottom because yep, the next 307. Yeah, and then they ripped it, and they've been ripping it since, and they're trying to fill you know, that gap. They're halfway to fill in it. So you know what? I think Amazon chart's going to look similar here. I just think you got to wait a couple days, let the dust settle. If that thing puts in like a little double bottom at like 1924, look out for the turn. So, you know, because that's how these things go. Even Bed Bath & Beyond, like these little two-day lows in the same area, the strategy just works. You see Bed Bath & Beyond, 913, 913. I actually did trade this. Um, you know, and we were looking, but it had the 913 low, 913 low. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to try it. I bought it like very close to the lows, like 920. I was like, I stopped. I put my stop like 905. I'm like, if it takes out and doesn't make that little double bottom there, I think it's going to be, you know, I don't want to be in it. But I was like, you know, maybe this turns and they do turn on these little, you know, double bombs that we're calling 913, 913 consecutive lows in the same two days uh, or very close to it. And uh, it turned around. I actually sold it already. I just held it for a couple of days, but it worked out very well. 
So sometimes these turns happen just when you get consecutive lows on the same day. So that's why I'd look for an Amazon too. Let's see if it could take out the 1924 low from Friday. If that holds, then it gets interesting again because this is a story that is loved. I do expect, when, I, I suspect, when you look at the stock a month from now, I bet you it's going to be getting a lot of these losses back as long as we stay, you know, the market stays strong because this is a stock that so many ETFs hold and so many people love. So I wouldn't bet against Amazon here. Uh, I like uh, the Bed Bath & Beyond, Dennis, one of your your traits, uh, hating a stock, but, you know, you like it. I still hate the stock. <laughs> I still hate the company, but the stock price had a little tradable bottom. So I just used it for a tradable bottom for a couple of days. I mean, you can trade anything. You don't even have to like the story. You could still go long the stock in certain instances. You just got to have your tight stops and make sure you don't get caught. The one consideration is when you're holding overnight, I mean, bad news can happen overnight. Bed Bath & Beyond is a stock that could be prone to bad news, but we're a ways away from their report. So it felt safe to hold for a couple of days and it turned around. It might keep going here. I mean, it's still in there. I just, you know, I, I was risking like a dime and I made like 60 cents or something, <laughs> 70 cents, six to seven to one risk reward. I was like, good enough. I'm out. You know, that was, it wasn't a long-term investment. It was just a short-term trade. I was in there. I was in there yesterday buying, uh, you know, the old... Bells? Dish scrubber. I go in there. I'm, I go you in there. Go in there. You talk this company and you still. I, go in there. I spent eleven dollars and forty eight cents or fourteen. What did you get for fourteen dollars? And I and I got uh, and I had a coupon too. You got to come with the coupon. Uh, you know the thing that you have in the um, uh, in the sink that does the dishes. You know what do you call that? The scrubber. Your hands. No. <laughs> come on, help me out. A scrubber. In their sink. Yeah, scrubber. I just use a dishcloth. Nah, man. We got like industrial cool. ones. It has a big old stand in there. Yeah, a fancy one. And I keep breaking it. And then so I. <laughs> they break. That's I your know, buy the I cheap know. one. I know. But, uh, <laughs> You're supposed to be getting good ones from Bed Bath & Beyond. They're supposed to know what they're going, going doing there. I, I know exactly where they are because I have to go buy them like uh, any six months. But uh, okay, let's move what, on. Go on. Yeah, go back to the chat here. What's happening? Uh, Neve here in our pre market chat there at Benzinga, our pre market at Benzinga.com, saying there's some talk here. Grub, what's the story on Grub here today? Because it is popping five bucks almost in the pre market. Obviously, there's a headline driver here. Uh, this one slipped through because I didn't write it down on my sheet. I've been trading a lot of stocks this morning, so I missed a few things. Well, what's, uh, what's the deal here? There was a merger in the in the European food delivery scene, I guess you can call it that. Uh, so uh, let's see what it is. Uh, Dutch food delivery company Takeaway.com has um, bought the UK partner Just Eat, which Amazon uh, had – and Amazon had previously acquired a stake in Just Eat's rival last year. So Just Eat and Takeaway, two European delivery firms, they are merging uh, also – Similar to that, uh, Amazon is buying or in talks to buy Uber Eats India, according to a report in the Business Standard. So this is your catalyst. So grab getting a nice pop on this. One concern is the high of the move, seventy nine fifteen. That's kind of where you're hanging out here right now. I'd just say eighty bucks. You know, let's see what it does. Can it get through eighty? Does it stall out here and start to give it back? A lot of times, these sympathy moves give it back. So if I was long this thing. I'd probably ring the register just because it's already up a pretty good, you know, pretty good 6% for, you know, a sympathy move here with another merger. A lot of times those don't hold and you're coming up to a big technical level. So it's not a bad setup, even for a short leaning on the 80. So if I was a trading over 80, it'd probably cover. Sometimes they sneak their head over. You got to give it a little wiggle room. You know, you go 80 and it gets up to 80, 10 and you stop yourself up. Sometimes you got to give them a little wiggle room. But if I was shorting at like 79 and a half, I probably would want to be covered. I'd give myself a buck, maybe to 80 and a half, something like that. But I like this better setup from the short side and fade this move. Uh, yeah, taking a look at had uh, had some resistance at 79.20, 79.30. Actually, that 79.15 high uh, looks to be important as well. That was your high on July 1st, your monthly high. Also kind of the top of the trading range. So important for it to uh, hold that area. I was actually talking with Lisa a little bit about, uh, you know, the the uh, Ubers and the lifts and stuff. And uh, she is just not super bullish. She says she's had like three or four patients over the last couple months uh, that have been pretty bad accidents. Uh, from uh, Uber in Lyft. And I just wondered, oh. you know, yeah, 
I just wonder where, you know, the liability, I don't know, the insurance issues and stuff, you know, where all that lies. I guess it lies with the individual driver and stuff. But, uh, man, oh, man, I mean, you're a little kid. You, you know, you're told not to get in your car with strangers I'm, here. And uh, I mean, not- that's always the concern here that I've had with Uber, too. Like, just my thought process. And I use Uber and I use Lyft. I use them both. I think they're great. Uh, but the one thing I've always thought about is like you can be a driver on an Uber in like an hour with an online, you know, just going through and doing the application. I mean, the one thing, you know, with a traditional taxi is, you know, these guys, you know, maybe not in all instances, but they've got a little bit more training probably to them, um, you know, that I would assume anyways, because uh, there's licenses, there's a lot of other stuff involved. So it seems like uh, you know, the screening process is a little bit light, in my opinion, for the Uber and the Lyft, but uh, in any regard here, you know, the, obviously the businesses have done very well and I use them and I don't really think about it too much. Just, you know, we talked about that on the show is if I had a kind of, you know, crazy that, you know, 90 minutes, somebody can be an Uber driver. Yeah. And uh, Uber, I did. It's still kind of just hanging out at this, uh, that IPO price. We all remember that open at 44. It's been a, above it at 47 all time high. But really just nice consolidation here at that 44. That was the LP, IPO price. And Lyft is, see how the Lyft chart uh, works. Uh, Lyft, boy, still really, I mean, it's recovered somewhat from that uh, overpriced IPO, trading up 20, 23 cents today, 65.75. Uh, recent high in the move, I'd like uh, 68.33. We're looking for a couple more points. And then also the old 50%, what we went from. 89 basically to what do we have 40 point move 20 we're right back in that whole 50 percent area so 66 67 if we get up and hold that uh long term here maybe lift go back and try and make a high but you probably got a lot of people stuff from those first couple days of trading because that one did not give you did not give you much of a chance to get out if you bought that early Continuing on here, just thoughts. Uh, we're going to get bounces here in two minutes, but let's go back to the overall market here and just look. I mean, what are your thoughts here? We got a Fed decision on Wednesday. That's obviously going to be a driver. I mean, I just look here. I just don't see the catalyst, at least in the near future, to take us down. I mean, the China talks look like they've stalled, so there's not a lot of headlines coming from there. Um, well, there is a headline that- now. They're going, they're going to China today. I mean, is this, but they're muted responses to these headlines now. It used to be, and Joel, you, I think you'd agree with me. I mean, we look at this when we were talking about this four, five, three, four months ago, like crazy responses, you know, off of this, you know, off of news. And now you just don't even see any response at all. Um, I, I just don't think a deal is imminent, even though there's going to be, you know, a meeting over there. It's just, well, why, I, if I'm Trump, I mean, like, your markets are at all time highs, kind of going smooth sailing here right now. I mean, why hurry to make a deal and why not try to get the best deal possible? So that's the way I think he negotiates. At least it's, it, it appears it's the way he negotiates. So I just don't see the near term, you know, uh, reason for Trump to do a deal. No. And I think, you know, he just wants the, you know, the fed to, you know, make their move on Wednesday. And then, so that'll be interesting and pretty much quarter point, uh, you know, baked in and then the jobs number, I guess, I don't know. The Fed seems to really have their made mind made up because the last few data points we got yeah. have been better than expected. And- they they really do seem to have their mind made up. Um, you know, because they were even on that you know press conference before focusing on all the negatives from you know Europe, China, wherever they could to try to you know justify their reasoning here for obviously lowering rates because from our data we I just don't see the reason. But I mean, it looks like they're going. Um, I don't think they're going to half. What, what is the expectation? Are they still saying they could possibly go a half? Do we, do we have that? Down? Yeah, uh, UBS uh, and uh, there's a couple places. But uh, actually, I, if you get if you get a chance, um, Scott Menard uh, from Guggenheim, uh, he's on CNBC and he wrote in Barron's and uh, he's kind of thinking like us. I mean, he was a little bit more extreme, but uh, he thinks the Fed's really going to run into some problems here with these, uh, you know, consecutive rate cuts and really light that fire of inflation. He also, you know, mentioned some of the points you did. There are some, there are some inflationary sectors out there that aren't really figured into the, uh, 
into the uh, CPI. So we'll Hershey's see. raising prices 10%. Yep. What was that? Yeah, I know. And, but that doesn't, you can't include that because. No, I don't like including inflationary stuff. CME FedWatch tool says 23% chance of a half point cut. And I, I, t- I tend to go by that. I've, I, I'm a 23%. Big, 23% Still, chance of a half point cut. It's incredible. What would the market do if it cut it a half? Then they would be Who like, "Who knows? Oh. You don't even know the responses. Like it's so impossible to predict the res- You could have that data and have that information, and you still wouldn't know how to trade it. It could do anything. It could be like, "Oh, they're going. They must really know that there's problems going on when they're going a half and sell." So it could it could do that. It probably rallies like crazy if they go a half. But who knows? This market is so finicky. It does funny things, and it's hard to interpret. You know, the, the responses, even on earnings, like we've seen some pretty good earnings reports and the stocks get sold. So it's all about the expectations going in. And what are the expectations going in? Well, some people are obviously still expecting a half. I don't think they're going a half. I think they're going a quarter. But you know, I guess the market still thinks it's a possibility. All right. Uh, we just passed in balance time here at 831 on uh, Benzinga's pre-market prep show. Well. Yeah, as General a- Motors fifty thousand to sell, fifty one thousand to sell. It kind of stands out a little bit. General Electric, which always has a sell balance, two hundred forty five thousand to sell here in GE. Uh, let's go look at Pfizer. Only thirty two thousand to sell in Pfizer. It's very early here this morning. Pfizer is now below forty two. That's a critical level for it. it. Needs to get back up and hold that forty two, or this could be a slippery slope to forty one in a hurry. Uh, that's there's not that much standing out. Uh, GM uh, due to report this week, and the only re- reason I mentioned GM is nice it, run for GM it, too. Got hit on the four numbers. Yeah, That's- yeah, they shrugged off the four numbers. Yeah, what's going on at forty one? JV Spec. I don't have my book open yet. I forgot to open my uh, platform for that. Um, is there anything at forty one? Because that looks like one, two, three highs right in the same area. I see. I could get my book open in about two minutes. I see four. I see 40, 92, 40, 91, 40, 82. Yeah, it's got to be something perched at 41. Maybe yeah. JV Spec has that number if there's something there. If JV, I haven't seen him in the chat this morning if he's there. And uh, we will be having uh, Michelle Cribs on from Cox Automotive. We've missed timing. a couple of earnings. Yeah. Well, don't forget, we have auto sales coming out uh, and- Thursday or Friday, I want to say. It's, it's, it's always the the – beginning of the month okay. so keep that in mind as well jv spec doesn't see anything at 41 so oh, it looks like there's something hidden there maybe it's an iceberg yeah yeah exactly oh and uh did you see the uh the tweet from uh bill santiago over the weekend All hey, right. what's bill saying he says my favorite pre-market ticks tips of the week beware of iceberg battles fade logic and just say no to family ski vacations. <laughs> uh, Bill. Yes. Shout out to Bill. All right, eight coming up on eight. Making us laugh. Uh, should we should we save the Beyond Meat preview for after our guest here? What do you? Yeah, because we'll go on to Beyond Meat for a while. So talk Beyond Meat after our guest. Let's go get our guest. Okay, so we'll, get, well, our guest is actually here. So let, let me bring him oh, on right now. Uh, Ian Weiner is joining our show. He is an advisor at Drexel Hamilton. He is also an author of the book Ubiquitous Relativity. He is uh, a blogger, and actually one of the reasons we're having him on today is because he wrote a post that Great post. that b- both Joel and I thought was uh, highly amusing, entertaining. Uh, Ian, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having me. So uh, I want to talk about this post. I assume that's that's why part of why Joel reached out. But you uh, you wrote this post. Actually, you wrote two posts on on your LinkedIn uh, on your LinkedIn profile a couple of weeks ago, just about visiting the floor and reminiscing about what life was like on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange compared to what it is today. Uh, what was the impetus for that? I had been asked to go down on the floor by CNBC to be a guest host for an hour um, on one of their shows. And I hadn't been down to the actual floor since 1998 when I left it. Um, So seeing what it was then versus what it was when I was there was the impetus behind, uh, you know, just sort of reflecting back a little bit on that. And I was um, pretty taken back by how many people responded to it and how many people really kind of felt uh, nostalgic for the, the, the time when people used to trade with each other um, as opposed to machines. So uh, that, that was the catalyst for that. And then 
my my experience as a sell side trader was sort of the follow up to that. And uh, yeah, both articles uh, see, you know, have you know touched a nerve, which is nice with with people um, who, who miss those days. I, I just liked how you described it. You said it was eerily eerily similar to the Cantina in Moss Isley. Uh, but instead of Hammerhead playing the saxophone, we had brokers of every ethnicity screaming at each other in a cacophony that might as well have been Tagalog. If you don't you've never seen Star Wars, you wouldn't get that, those references. But I thought that was a really great way. Having never been to the floor in its heyday, I, it, picturing that, it made it more more real for me. So I thought that was a great way of describing what it was like down there. Yeah, a lot of people, uh, especially those of a certain generation like myself, uh, uh, can appreciate uh, that scene in Star Wars as a defining scene. And so, yeah, as I search for metaphors for the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, that seemed to be uh, the most appropriate. And uh, were there any uh, any relics still around from your day? Was there anybody that uh, was still down there banging it out? Any $2 brokers or I guess they're not they're not specialists, designated market makers, anyone you recognized? Um, I saw one or two people uh, who looked like they were still hanging in and doing different things, but it, it was hard to even appreciate the fact that it was still an exchange just based on how few people were there and just how quiet it was. Um, it was just so different. Yeah. I mean, uh, with the, uh, with the evolution uh, of trading, electronic trading, I enjoyed some of the stories, you know, what, uh, what actually went on there and uh, a lot of the characters on the floor. Uh, were you, um, were you down there? I don't know. Are they still running the death pool on the New York Stock Exchange? Do you know what I'm referring to? Well, if I, first of all, if anybody's running a death pool, they know that you're not allowed to talk about it. Oh. So, so you know, I couldn't confirm or deny if there is a death pool down there. Okay. All right. Uh, that That's good. That's a good cover up there. Uh, what about the markets here? You wrote a while back about the uh you know the fed and uh trump and you kind of you agreed uh with the el presidente about you know the rate cut here you're getting the rate cut coming up uh supposedly a quarter uh you know is this the course that we need to follow is there really some weakness underneath this market that we're not seeing or uh what's the fed doing here are they just being bullied by the white house i would say they're being bullied by the white house um, I would say that they feel probably that if anything goes wrong, it's going to be pinned on them. Um, and, you know, they're doing things that make really no sense based on any historical uh, narrative. But uh, for whatever reason, they feel that with the market here and employment at these levels that they need to give further stimulus to the uh, economy. Uh, and you have central banks around the world doing it. So, You've got a Federal Reserve that seems pretty determined to keep a bid in the market. Um, and I get the sense they do pretty dramatic things, perhaps even go negative on short term rates at some point uh, to make sure that the market continues its bid. Whether or not that works, um, I don't know. But for now, um, you know, it's hard to see how we the market goes down a lot in an environment where the expectation is that the Fed's just going to uh, be incredibly dovish for the next six months. Well, how do in negative interest rates? I mean, this we're seeing this around the world here. You know, I saw some stats coming and showing how many bonds have negative interest rates or not. Who buys a bond with a negative interest rate? Like, who buys a bond that says, okay, I'm going to loan you $100,000 and you're going to give me back 99900 uh, in two years. I mean, who buys that? I mean, what is the point to owning that? Well, um, I'm going to give you, I'm going to sell you a bond and I'm going to give you, I'm, I'm, and you're going to give me some of my money back. I mean, well, I don't get all my money back. It's crazy. What, well, what you're describing is sort of what the hope is that, that people say, well, I'm not going to keep my money in the bank. I'm going to go spend it and therefore stimulate the economy. Unfortunately, in Europe, they found the opposite was true that people thought, well, geez, if I'm getting negative interest rates, things must be really bad. So I'll be willing to lose a little money so I don't lose a lot of money. And as far as who's buying them, you know, sadly, it's it's you, me, and probably a lot of your your viewers who own global bond funds through ETFs oh, who, who's, you know, are buying these bonds with negative yields because that's the mandate of a global bond ETF. So, so the people who are losing money are actually all of us. 
people who are buying it don't realize they're buying it. I'm going to go sell all my bond funds now. <laughs> so, so okay. So do you think, like you were saying, you think the U.S. might go this way too, like at negative interest rates as well? Eventually, yeah. Maybe by the end of 2020. But I think so because you've got this weird kind of spiral downwards where every other bond uh, you know, yields continue to go lower. And so ours look relatively better, but even though they're going to be below 2% on the 10 year or whatever it is. So, you know, I get the sense that I don't see what stops us from on a short term level um, going negative. Uh, it just feels like the, 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 the doves are there, the pressure is there. And um, it just feels like the, the fund flows and the leverage that people are using this, this sort of long stock, long bond trade, um, you know, should just continue to get amplified. Uh, Ian, before we let you go, any, anything catch your eye this earnings season so far? Well, I mean, I think that all in all, it's been okay. Um, I think that the, the, the thing that I'm most interested in, obviously, you'll, you'll have Apple report, you've got the Fed, You've got China. Uh, it's really kind of a microcosm for the whole market this week, um, you know. But I'll be I'll be pretty focused on what Apple says. Uh, I think they've got the best read into China um, and sort of what's going on over there. Uh, but in general, I'd say it's it's probably slightly better than expected because I think people expected a decent amount of guide downs given the, the trade war. I don't think it's hit people yet. Uh, and I don't think that they've had the shock effect on consumers as far as price increases. So um, I'm not quite sure I conclude that yet, uh, but we'll see what Apple has to say. I think that's one you got to focus on. Are you with the consensus that uh, smartphone demand will, re- ha- will have recovered? Well, I mean, yes, it, it has recovered. I, I don't think that's Apple's biggest problem. I think Apple needs to figure out, you know, how to, create a subscription service that people are going to actually want to pay for. Um, and it's unclear that their content and everything else is going to be that. So that to me is, is whether a smartphone demand is recovered a little bit, I, you know, we'll see. It's hard to say. And uh, let's just, uh, let's just talk about the gold sector uh, real quickly here. Gold's had a really nice run. Um, as of late, you've had gold, the TLT in the market has just been a, a buy everything market here. Uh, with what you know, the Fed stance and looking at the uh, gold charts here. Um, what's your what's your outlook here next uh, three to six months for gold? Um, I think it's going higher. Um, I think it's had, a, as you said, a huge move. I think it's a, it's a wild consensus long. Um, that being said, it can still work. Um, I think it's all the same trade. I think it's all the same. A lot of the same global macro funds using leverage to buy gold, buy bonds, buy stocks. And so you're clearly setting yourself up for one of these wild, crazy kind of uh, dramatic sell-off slash VIX explosions, um, given the way that this is setting up. But, but for now, the gold will continue to look relatively better yielding, even though it's zero than what you're going to get with negative rates. So, so by, that, by that logic, it, it is a long. All right, and one more fun one for you. Beyond Meat uh, reporting after the close today, uh, the darling of uh, Wall Street so far this year. I don't know, I think it's up 800% since it's, uh, it's IB, IPO here. Uh, hard to talk technicals on this to get more information. But uh, first of all, have you had a Beyond Meat burger? And second, what do you think of the stock? So... First, I have had, I, I mean, I live in Los Angeles. So, you know, if, I, if you haven't had a Beyond Meat burger here, you haven't had it anywhere. Um, but here's my, my, after all the years I've done this, one thing's pretty, I'm pretty sure about. When the short interest is that high, those guys are usually right. Um, nine out of 10 times, they are right. Now, clearly, between here and there, it's a question of attrition warfare and who can survive in the short Uh uh, on the short side throughout moves like this. I don't think it's time yet. I think they've got a few more quarters. I think the first time you see them make some big announcement like a Burger King or whatever it is, and it doesn't go up, that's the day that I would start attacking it because solar companies did the same thing. They announced these deals that never happened. The stock would go crazy. And then eventually they just all got killed. But once they stopped going up on those announcements, 
that's when I start getting more interested on the short side. So that's what I would watch for. But but I do think they're going to be right. I think ultimately this stock is is, is going to go a lot lower. All right. Ian Weiner uh, is the author of the book Ubiquitous Relativity, also an advisor for Drexel Hamilton. I put his link to uh, the post we mentioned in our chats. Ian, as always, thanks for the time today and uh, have a good rest of the week. You guys are the best. Thank you. All right. All right, 8.30, whatever time is it now? It is. 8.46. 8.46 here and a sleepy Monday morning here. Uh, S&Ps are up a stick. We've only had a seven-point range. We are The average daily ranges have been coming down, so my expectations is for a 22-point range today. Uh, so if that low holds, that pre-market low of 3020, we could be up at the 3040 handle at uh, 304022. Uh, if in fact we turn things around and take out that pre market low, we could be down under 3000 at uh, 2998. And if you want to talk about a really good level uh, to lean on short term and long term, go into the SP futures from last week. We basically put in a triple bottom uh, at 26. 2996, 2998. So, uh, big, 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 big area support. I'm looking for anything negative to happen in the market until that is taken out. So, Dennis, uh, should we do the Beyond Meat preview? Yeah. You know, and a great thing. This is a great point that Ian just made here. And I completely agree with that. Um, you know, he's saying, you know, when you look at those super high short interests, they usually eventually are right. So, that's telling you, you know, he's saying in the long term. Usually, if you have a stock with a huge short interest, it's usually going lower. It's a matter of whether they can hold through it all and all the pain. We don't know the path for it to get there. But if you're, you know, putting beyond me, and I had somebody talking to me this weekend, and they're like, oh, this is the stock. I'm going to put this in my kids, you know, long term portfolio type deal. Um, I think you're wrong. I think this is a mistake. I think, you know, valuation matters in the long run. You can trade anything. And do I want to be short it right now? No, 18% move on the earnings tonight. That's expected move. I mean, it's kind of like gambling. So, you know, I'm not going to have any position going into these earnings report, but, you know, if you're, if you're buying this thinking, okay, well, this is going to be the company. I'm going to put this in my long-term portfolio because this is just going to, the story's going to stay hot forever. A Beyond Meat's going to be in every, you know, burger chain. We're all going to be Beyond Meat burgers. I think you're wrong. I think in the long run, I think Ian's right. I think the short interest will be correct. It's a matter of, are these people going to make money being short? It may be not because they won't be able to hold it long enough. Maybe they'll get bought in. Maybe they won't even be allowed to hold it long enough. We've talked about those dynamics before too. Uh, so I think it's a trade. I think when I look at this two years from now, I think it's under 100 bucks. I think when I look at it a year from now, I think it's under 100 bucks. But who knows the path for it to get there? I do believe it's going to be like Tilray, where you see it, you know, it's going to have a blow off top eventually. We kind of thought that already happened, but it didn't go parabolic like the Tilray, where it went 100 to 300 in two days. So now, you you know, it, 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 you know, can it go parabolic on this earnings report? I mean, it could. It could do anything. It's 18% expected move, but a lot of high expectations now into this report. Let's see what it does. Uh, it's a coin flip, though. I will not be trading this in earnings. So let's talk about the numbers here. They're expected to lose nine cents a share on revenue of fifty-two and a half million dollars. So those are how the- much revenue? Fifty-two point five. Fifty-two million dollars. Million with an M. When does Apple make that? Like with by, an M by noon? Ten seconds. <laughs> Uh, so we're looking no, for so, that. Okay, so let's put this really in perspective and just see how crazy this is. So they have $52 million in quarterly revenue. So, you know, let's just say give them 250 So it's growing. Two, 221 is the consensus for the year. $221 million revenue. The thing has got a $14 billion market cap. It's worth $14 billion. And it's tra- $200 million in sales. Like, I mean, yes, it's going to grow, but to grow into that market cap to be even reasonable. I mean, and you think about that's not even talking about the bottom line. This is talking about the top line. You know, you get some of these cloud stocks that trade pretty crazy at eight, 10 times revenues. I mean, here you got a stock that's trading. I, I can't even do the math on that. What is that? Like four, $14 billion to 250 million in wow, revenue. 43 times. Some of 50 40... times revenue? Yeah, something like that. It's, it's, it's insane. It's insane to think that long-term I'm going to invest in this company. So all I will say is I believe if you're investing this long-term, you're going to eventually lose 70 or 80% of your money. And I will say I believe you're going to do that over the course of the next two years. 
but trading it, I've been long it a couple of times too. J- Jeremy Newsom has been long it a couple of times too. It's like a hot potato. You know, you could trade anything. Speculation is good that way. You can get out. Just don't get stuck holding after the story, uh, you know, starts to slow down. After the buzz ends and everybody's got their Beyond Meat burgers. And I don't know, maybe they're going to get like a contract. You know, they get a big one. Like they're getting contracts all the time. Maybe they do get one from like the McDonald's or something. And maybe that would really propel the stock. Like uh, these aren't at McDonald's yet. I, have, I don't think, are they? Mm, no, I don't believe like, Imagine it. if they got that contract. The yeah, stock would like, pop. That's a reason not to be short it. Yeah, so, and, and for the Dunkin' Donuts Beyond Meat sausage. That yeah, was. Dunkin' Donuts, Tim Hortons. They're an A and W in Canada. I don't know if they're an A and W in the states or not. Do you have A you have A and W in the states, don't you? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So yeah. they're there. I mean, they're in a few. But imagine they get like Burger King or you know Wendy's or McDonald's or one of the big. I mean, that's going to be a potential catalyst as well. Ian making a good point though. If they uh, you know ever get a contract like that and the stock sells off on that. That's telling you that the story really is over. I mean, we have no reason to believe that this buzz is over yet. The stocks made new all-time highs on Friday. Yes, it's trading down seven bucks in the pre-market. Yes, it has very high expectations to go in the earnings report. But who knows what they're going to say? I mean, imagine they just announced a big contract in that earnings report. The stock could really rip. So I'm definitely not shorting it into the report, even though long-term, I don't believe you're going to make money with it being long. And uh, I believe the short interest is up near 40%, 46%. It's very hard. I, yeah. Like, even if I wanted to short it, I've been saying that on the show for a little bit. I can't find a locate. So I'm trying again here this morning just for fun to see if there is anything out there. No, I'm no good here, too. So, um, you know, I've been having difficulty finding a locate on it. So how much of, you know, the recent buying could be even buy-ins? Floats, you know, very small. So it's difficult, you know, to find these locates. And uh, let's see here. We got uh, we got seven minutes left here on uh, Monday's pre market prep. Uh, analysts were kind of busy there uh, over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Kind of woke out of their slumber, and not a lot of people talk about analyst ratings. They they do move stocks here. So what? Uh, let's go with a couple couple juicy upgrades and a couple juicy downgrades and see if I'm moving the markets. Uh, going back to the biotech thing from earlier, Gilead catching an upgrade this morning from RBC. It is now their top pick or on their top pick list. Uh, Gilead is Just at the RBC. stock. It gets upgraded. It gets a lift for a day or two and then goes back into the doghouse. I don't know what it's going to take to Gil- Gilead. I don't know if I'm ever going to get off the mat. I do not own this. I'm glad I got out on that spike back in early 2018 when it spiked up over $80. And it's been uh, just a value trap forever. And I, I mean, yes, it doesn't make any sense that Beyond Meat will trade 100 times revenues, which is what Spinner is saying, versus Gilead that'll trade five times earnings. I mean, you know, you can't compare it's apples and oranges, but, you know, the valuations are, uh, this is, you know, just like Beyond Meat is on one extreme of the valuation scale, Gilead is on the other extreme. You know, and a lot of the biotechs are trading six, seven times earnings. They're dirt cheap on a valuation level, but there's no growth. And people, don't care about the bottom line here. They haven't cared about the bottom line for a long time in this market. They care about top line growth. That's what they want to see. The company doesn't have top line growth. They've tried to do it through acquisitions. They've tried to do other things. Until this market changes its opinion and starts to value value stocks you know, and, and value the bottom line again, it's hard to see why Gilead is going to take off, even though the stocks are cheap. Uh, it looks okay. It's trading up 94 cents in the pre-market, 67.86. So, man, it looks like it wants a little bit more, but I'd I'd really wait to see if it could get through 68 and a quarter. I want to know. Really, yeah, you got a pair of highs there that's backed up by 68.53 highs. So, if this is good and they're really going to take this thing up today, take it up over 70 dollars. You shouldn't even blink at 68 and a quarter. You should just keep the bid going. So we'll keep an eye on that. Um, in order to get the top of yesterday's range, you need to trade down to 6704. Um, also, we just had a uh, uh, a new guy. It uh, looks like it's RKDK is asking you about iRobot here. The reason I like to bring that up is because I like to look at stocks after their earnings move. And you had the earning washout low. It's yeah. 69 and a quarter. And then buyers have stepped up to 72. So if you're trying to swing trade here and you want to get a lot of points out of this, you can lean on that panic low at 69 to quarter because I think if you do go into retreat, you're going to find buyers that miss the bottom. And it's hard to get excited about this thing until it gets over 76. Uh, they had a high at 75.49 on uh, the uh, 
75 49 and then i see 75 93 so over 76 it looks like it wants to fill the gap but uh still got a lot of head over overhead supply there in irbt here's one interesting nxpi getting an upgrade this morning to outperform oh, at, yeah. at evercore they have earnings after the close today so evercore upgrading them and raising their price target to 125 into the earnings report Back up, man. Remember this thing would go from like 120. It was getting taken over, right, for a while. And that was before yeah, Qualcomm, well, Qualcomm, Qualcomm, right? Yeah, yeah Qualcomm. Qualcomm. Got involved there. It's got a lot of its losses back going into the report here, up a buck 64. If I was looking for a level on the upside, if it got near 108 and a half today, there's a pair of highs there. But really, I've not seen a lot of resistance until you get there. Uh, taking out, yeah, 108 and a half is a monthly high. So, We'll see what happens before the report. Other notable upgrade I saw was Anheuser Busch getting an upgrade at Bank America to buy. So that was probably the biggest one besides from the two I already mentioned. Wow, Bud's been on a tear here. Well, they had their good earnings last week, and uh, they had canceled their IPO, their Asian IPO spinoff. So I don't think it is on a run. You're right. Uh, as far as downgrades are concerned. Uh, let's see here. We had a couple. PayPal downgraded Guggenheim to sell. NetApp downgraded Longbow to neutral. Starbucks downgraded Baird to neutral. Actually, a couple of downgrades in Starbucks today. JP Morgan also downgraded them to neutral. UPS downgraded Stiefel to neutral. And uh, Dow Inc. had a couple of downgrades. Citigroup and Susquehanna. And as far as initiations, there's an interesting note from Goldman Sachs this morning on the restaurants. They are initiating – let me find the list here. Starbucks gets a buy. Actually, uh, Chipotle gets a buy. McDonald's sure. gets a buy. And then Wendy's get to sell and Jack in the Box get to sell. So two sells and four buys there for Goldman Sachs on the restaurants. Again, they say to buy – Starbucks, McDonald's, Chipotle, and buy Chipotle now, huh? What was the last one there? Boy, oh boy. That's What's it. at eight hundred? Yeah, nothing. The book's pretty empty. I guess just such an expensive stock. I do see nineteen hundred shares, which I guess is something considering you know it's an eight hundred dollars stock. But what oh, and Wingstop. Yeah, Wingstop. it looks like that's what it's going to test is eight hundred bucks. Yeah, uh, it's hard to. See. I mean, what do you say? I'm not paying up here now. It, the easy money's been made. In Chipotle. I mean, the stock's been running for a year and a half from $300 out to 800 Trades, you know, way with a, you know, very high valuation compared to its peers as well. So I think the easy money's been made, but you know, I've thought that for a while and it continues to run. So glad I'm not short it. Uh, David in the Google chat just asked about, you know, buying long-term puts in uh, Beyond Meat. I mean, you're just going to oh, pay up. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you, you know, if you, you're going to pay, I mean, maybe if you want to try that strategy, you know, maybe have a put, you know, put on a put spread or something. So at least you're selling a little bit of decay here. But uh, especially, I mean, going into the reports, um, you know, it's the, the premiums are going to be really jacked up on this one. As far as technically speaking, I see this thing move all over during the day. Uh, but uh, we'll be keeping an eye on the closing price that you had um, in the issue ahead of the report in the <clears throat> session. Uh, that old time closing high on Friday came in at 234.90. So paying more attention to that than that old time high at 239.71. I'm looking at that old time closing high, 234.90. A tight 24 point range in that stock on uh, on Friday on 16 million shares. So, uh, a lot of a lot of look at these long term puts on Beyond Me. So the 200. So if you want to go long term, January 2021. So it gives you a year and a half. That's pretty let long. Me guess. The year, let me guess. 25 bucks. The 200 puts. You're guessing 25. It's 35 points out of the money, and you're guessing 25 dollars. Yeah. It's 85 dollars. Oh. It's 85 dollars. So the thing could go under 100 bucks, and if you bought that, you'd make 15, risking 85. How do you make money by having puts? How you know, even if you're trying to do the spreads, Joel, it's so hard because first they're illiquid. Right. And interest on these things are like, you know, they, yeah, there's some, but I mean, on the 200s, there's 318 contracts open. On the 195s, there's three contracts open. The spreads the market makers are holding are like four dollars on them. So you know, each you know, so from 195 to 200, 
you're just looking that you can't even like it, it to work that spread even is, is going to be tough too i mean it's so difficult to make money on the short side on this like unless you just have the guts and you say i'm gonna i could get a locate i'm gonna short stock 85 dollars really for the 200 so putt so i've you're... never seen a premium that high so i've you're... never seen it that have you ever seen it that high it's a hundred. So go to the hundred, the one hundred putts, which is a hundred and thirty-five points out of the money. It's twenty-five bucks. There's only nine on open interest, so it's trading with a five-point spread. It's twenty-five dollars for that on the Friday, like where it was quoted at the close. Like, and obviously I'm taking the mid or twenty. Okay, right, so yeah, yeah. twenty-two to twenty-three fifty. So let's say twenty-three, twenty-two and a half bucks. Holy cow! The premiums on these are absolutely insane. If you think it's going like really far down, you can get 50, the 50 putts, which are 180 points out of the money. They're, they're even five and a half bucks. Yeah. Bill Phillips mentioned crazy. some calls, but like just who knows, man? Yeah. I mean, the you premiums know. are crazy. Yeah. Well, and then it goes to 500 on you because why? You know, it's already ridiculous. It's already inflated. It's already got the short interest really high. It goes to three, four, 500 on you, and you're in a real lot of pain. I mean, it's, it's, you know, you don't know the path. So just because, you know, we're saying a year and a half from now, it's going to go to here. I mean, can you hold through the pain if this thing goes to 300 or 400? I mean, it could do it. It's really, really hard to make money on this, even though a lot of people believe, and I'm being one of them, that it's going to be a lot lower a year and a half or two years from now. It's really hard to make money with that call. All right. I just, uh, I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, Tommy Lackey. Uh, who was on the show on Friday and he talked about the trade desk, uh, TTD and uh, man, oh man, I wish I could be starts out instead of like resistance uh, as breakouts. And whew, that was one hell of a breakout on Friday. Uh, you went from 255.22 to 278.55. Uh, you are trading above your high from Friday. Your high from Friday was 279.71. So I don't know, I guess I'd be, just moving a stop up and maybe get 300 bucks on this thing. I just absolutely no resistance in here. Spencer, you want to wrap things up and uh, preview Tuesday show? All right. That'll be it for today's show. If you missed any part of it, you can rewatch it on YouTube or catch our podcast. It's available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, basically anywhere podcasts are available. Thanks to our guest, Ian Weiner. Thanks to all of you in our chat. If you missed any part, oh, said that already. If you want to email us, do that. Premarket at Benzinga.com address any questions comments concerns there as far as tomorrow's show we will be joined by nick shaheen because it is every other tuesday and tomorrow is that tuesday so nick sheen our options expert who will join us tomorrow at 8 35 in the meantime please remember that everything on our show is meant for informational purposes only not meant to be investing or trading advice everyone have a good rest every day we will see you on tuesday <laughs>